Okay, hi and welcome to everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today for our discussion of the black body and the white gaze, images of African-American athletes. My name is Issa, Issa Nefertari Yulin, and I was asked to do this panel, to moderate this panel by Chelsea Piers uh, and the team at Chelsea Piers. I wanna say thank you to everyone that works for Chelsea Piers here in Brooklyn. We're happy to be here and talk about the ways that the black body has figured in the American imagination through time. I am a professor of African and diasporic literatures at Hunter College. I'm a published writer, an author, and I do these kinds of webinars from time to time as well as a participant and as a moderator. So I'm happy to be here. I'm also happy to be here with my wonderful panelists, Daoud Anyabwile, Linda Villarosa and Erica Hardison. I'm going to give you more information about all of them and loop them in in just a minute, but I wanted to set the tone for today's discussion with some images that uh, we can all sort of land on the same page with. Um, and whenever we're talking about black people in the United States, we often start from a point of dispossession, of marginalization, of silence, of loss. And it's important to me that we start in Africa from a place of empowerment, of joy, of connection, of community, of home. And so here I have for us some beautiful images of African people to sort of set the tone for our discourse today. And I want us to recognize the inherent beauty and value and worth of black women and black men prior to uh, European contact and through colonialism and even the dispossession of the Middle Passage. And when we have this conversation about black people, it's important for us to recognize um, this connection between Africa and the United States and this point of dispossession that occurred, of course. Um, this is a page actually from the Black Book, which was edited by the great, late great now, uh, Toni Morrison. And, you know, when I look at this image, I simply see a beautiful man who is standing with his weapon in his hands. But we know that images like this have become fetishized and consumed by whiteness in this country and globally. And so we'll talk about not just African-American athletes, but black bodies more broadly and the consumption of black bodies by white people. And of course, for this consumption to occur, we have to talk about the middle passage. And this image is important to me because of the literal and figurative subjugation of black bodies, a literal putting down, a denigration, and a capture, a holding of black bodies that of course has psychological and emotional uh, ramifications that really reverberate in the public realm and populate the American uh, imagination, right? The uh, sort of public imagination about African-Americans and our beautiful black bodies. And when we see this dispossession of black bodies, I think it's important to understand that beneath all the caricatures, beneath all the racism, there is always this persistence of whiteness, right? And, and this consistent um, uh, domination of whiteness as a way to subvert and co-opt and commodify blackness, right? To monetize blackness and to entertain with blackness. Um, but beneath all of the ugly stereotypes, beneath all of the uh, ugly caricatures, there is this whiteness that we need to recognize and recognize whiteness as a social construct, right? There's no biological basis for this evil. It is all socially constructed. But even in our possession, if you will, even in our enslavement, uh, we were athletic and strong and powerful. Um, here is an image of Ansel Williamson, who was um, one of the many enslaved black people who were used to race horses um, during the slave era. And then following emancipation after the Civil War, 
might be interesting for some of you to know when we're talking about uh, African Americans and sport, that horse racing was actually dominated by African Americans uh, at the turn of the century. And in fact, this gentleman, Isaac Burns Murphy, was the most uh, celebrated of all of the jockeys in American history. He had a victory rate that has yet to be matched. And Murphy was not alone. He was not an anomaly. He was in community with people like Oliver Lewis in the middle and Jimmy Winkfield on the right of your screen. And these black jockeys really dominated the sport again in the late 19th and early 20th century. But by the mid 20th century, this sport had become all white and caricatures and images like this lawn jockey started to dominate um, really the public imagination as a replacement, right? It sort of erased or veiled the truth of African participation, African-American participation in that particular sport. Um, and these lawn jockeys were really prevalent. Those of us who are Gen X and older remember seeing them all the time. Um, through the 80s, I don't think people started to remove them from their lawns until the 90s. But of course they still exist. They exist in corners of the imagination. They exist in galleries. Uh, they exist and they still inform the way that we talk about African-American athletes in mainstream media, like this Vogue magazine cover with beautiful and wonderful LeBron James and the international supermodel Giselle. Um, and this was quite a controversial cover, which we'll talk about a little more in depth. Um, on its own, it seems rather benign and not too uh, scandalous, not too controversial. But when juxtaposed with this World War I uh, US Army recruitment poster, it takes on very sinister connotations, indeed very sinister denotations. This coupled with the fact that African-Americans have historically over the past 400 years been referred to denigrated as monkeys, as apes, as subhuman. Um, and indeed during both World War I and World War II, European women were told the lie that black servicemen had tails, right? Like monkeys. Um, this image takes on a whole different meaning and so we have to understand this history to understand what we're talking about when we talk about black athletes. And this is particularly interesting because we have this wonderful and proud heritage of athletes like Althea Gibson and Arthur Ashe who dominated tennis in the mid 20th century. And out of that, more sort of conservative appearing African-American athlete. By the 1980s, we had the beautiful Florence Griffith Joyner known as Flojo, fondly as Flojo, who really set a new standard for black female beauty and a kind of bold assertion of color and light and joy. Um, and one of the best uh, track and field athletes of all time. And I think of her as sort of a style progenitor of Serena. Um, and we are gonna to talk today about Serena Williams and the public discourse around uh, not just Serena, but her sister Venus um, and the clothes they wear, the accessories, the hairstyles uh, and the way that the public discourse has really been framed around these excellent athletes who really should simply be celebrated for their athletic gifts and we shouldn't even be having conversations about their outfits, but we're gonna talk about their bodies and how they present through time. And we have to, here is the Rutgers basketball team. They were infamously denigrated by Don Imus, who referred to them on air as, and I quote, nappy headed hoes, as he laughed and called them this. And so, you know, again, in this context, we have to talk about these images of black athletes and how they feed a racist narrative about who we are as a people. And that is why we have to continue to use our bodies in social protest. Even our young people are animated in their activism and their desire for freedom, freedom for their minds and their beautiful black bodies. This is a long history. 
it predates Tommy Smith and John Carlos. But of course, this is a famous image of them at the 1968 Olympics. And here we have Cap in a very similar posture. And so now I'd like to talk about the ways that image really informs content and how these images get us talking and get us thinking about who we are as a people and how white America thinks about who we are. And I wanna start with Dawood. Dawood Anyabwile is an Emmy award-winning artist, illustrator, and co-creator of the groundbreaking comic book series, Brother Man, Dictator of Discipline. Original art and artifacts from the Brother Man series were added to the permanent collection of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Illustrator of, illustrator of the sports related graphic novels, The Crossover, Booked and Becoming Muhammad Ali, Dawood has worked with companies such as Cartoon Network, Turner Studios, NBA TV, and Nickelodeon as a character designer, storyboard artist, illustrator, and concept artist. In addition to his Emmy, he has won the Key to Kansas City for Outstanding Service to Children, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the East Coast Black Age of Comics Convention, an Eisner Award, and two Glyph Comics Awards. Born and raised in Philadelphia, Anwa uh, Daoud has volunteered and uh, also teaches art classes to young students and gives lectures when he isn't working on his art. And he can be followed on Instagram at Brother Man Comics with an X. So Daoud, can you start by telling us in that last slide, we saw two of the books that you illustrated, the sports themed uh, graphic novels that you illustrated. And these are books, of course, that are really for young readers. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about your own childhood as a young Black man growing up in Philadelphia and the influences that, you know, images of Black athletes had on you and your future work as an illustrator. What were some of the images that you remember from your own childhood and how did they influence you? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me on the you know this uh, discussion. That was a really good intro, and nice setup for the for the discussion. Um, just a little background on myself. You know, just growing up, I wasn't really like a, a sports fanatic. You know, I was more into the creative field and drawing and uh, things like that. And um, the, the primarily, the I would say the sports that would be watched around our house was boxing. So Ali was always um an icon you know in our home and for me personally i always feel as though out of all athletes he was the one that always stood out to me so to be able to work on the becoming muhammad ali book you know that was kind of like a that was like a more than a dream come true it's kind of more like a spiritual connection because i felt as though you know, the thing that I felt about uh, sports growing up, you know, a lot of my friends were into sports and things like that. I never had anything against it. I, I was just that indoor guy that liked to draw. But um, the way my father was, my father was an activist. He was always kind of like a frontline person. Um, and he taught us at an early age about owning and controlling what you do. So even when it comes to art, you know, even like when the whole graffiti era and all that was coming up, coming around like in Philly in the 80s and stuff like that, he was saying, you know, you don't want to be that person that just puts your work up and it's for public display and everybody can just basically jack it and they make the money off of it. You got to control what you do. So when it came to sports, I always felt as though like um, we should have our own leagues. You know, we should be thinking in the, and I'm not saying people aren't doing this, but I'm just saying for me personally, the way I looked at it is the thing that really grabbed my attention is when I hear power moves outside of just the sport because when i look at how we're treated within the sports industry i feel like it's the it's pretty much the same way we'll be treated in the united states regardless what our occupation is because if you take somebody who's who's a basketball player take them off the court and put him in an office building he may still be treated the same way than his white counterpart so we have to look at if we control the industry or control the image that we produce, you may not deal with these issues because 
you are are determining uh, what the outcome should be. You know, like because when I'm drawing, you know, I don't think of it as I'm just drawing pictures. There is a there is a distinct uh, message that I think through before I draw something. Mm -hmm. So it's not just you know uh, something just happened to be what it is. It's it's plotted out. So. Um, so I'm just saying, like, just to open it up, you know, I can go with that a little bit more. That's mm -hmm. kind of been my connection to sports growing up. I always looked at it from the economic standpoint. And I feel like that's one reason why we usually be little is because we don't own that industry. Yeah, that's true. And in terms of owning your art and owning the images that you produce, I know you mean this in terms of monetization, right? And that you own the rights to the work that you produce. And amen to that. But I'm also thinking about it in a more spiritual or psychological sense. When you go in and you're drawing a young Muhammad Ali, for example, or you're just drawing a young man from around the way for the crossover who's a basketball player, you know, is there like a, a, an intentionality? Are you thinking about young people that you grew up with? Are you thinking about, you know, all of our people? You know, what do you bring to these beautiful images of young black athletes that you're producing for young people to read, black and other colors? I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that, that's usually the question that that's not asked of me, but that's what I feel internally. As you can see behind me, it says Drawing from the Soul, which is my uh, YouTube channel, which I um, focus on talking about drawing from the soul, the double entendre is not necessarily drawing, is pulling from who you are. Because oft, oftentimes, um, you know, when we, if, when we consume media and we consume all these things that are like, uh, it's like a lot of chatter that's in our minds constantly. It, regardless if you consciously, consciously think about it, it's subconsciously telling you what your place is in society. Mm -hmm. Now, I recognize that at, at an early age because I used to do custom airbrush shirts like in the 80s, like in the early 80s uh, at the Gallery Mall downtown Philly. So I always had uh, ear to the street. Like I've always was dealing with uh, my community and I was doing it at a time where, you know, black images wasn't really popular among our generation. Kids were getting like knockoff. Disney, Disney or Mickey Mouse shirts and turning them black, but I was actually drawing you the way you are, you know, uh, profiling and doing your thing, which led to the Brother Man comic series, which led to inspiring basically two generations of young black artists and then some. So to me, when I'm doing Ali and crossover, and it doesn't matter, like a book comes to me, especially when it's about us, which mm -hmm. is my preference, I always channel those spirits of my my ancestors, my 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 own children. I have two sons, uh, actually thirty and twenty five, I think this year, and um, and also the um, my peers. Like when I was growing up, the things that we were into, and I always felt like we were always marginalized, especially in in sports and in mass media. Because when we mm -hmm. talk about like the power, you know how you, you show the, the brother in Africa, and he's, he's standing in his power. Yeah. And he's being, he is. And, and our right. athletes, they're being who they are. We should just be celebrating them for their power. The problem comes in when they connect the mind to the body. If it's yeah. just a body and it's just that work mule, you know, they'll love it all day long. But when they start stepping out you know, say you have uh, Serena and she's being powerful and she's stepping out and she's not uh, following everybody else's rule. Now she's thinking for herself. Then it becomes a problem. You I see what I'm saying? And totally. that's right. So to me, when I draw, I don't think about uh, a restriction on who, who, who my characters are. And I want them to have depth. Who's their mom? Who's their dad? Who's their cousin? You know, right. they didn't exist in a vacuum. And like my brother calls it a universal orphan. Like a lot of times we see these black characters and we don't see their family. It's almost like they exist in a group of other white characters, but it's like the white characters, they have a family and the brother, he just hangs out with them. But who does he go home to? What girls like him? You always talking about the other girl that likes the main character. And I'm like, brother, who likes you? 
Right. You know what I mean? So we get put into that space. So to me, I like working on projects that show the full scope of us. Like when you're dealing with Ali, you're dealing with Ali's family. You're dealing with him going up against uh, a system that's designed to uh, keep him um, uh, in, a, in a space where he's compacted in his thoughts, but he breaks out of that. So Perfect. to me, that's one of the reasons, like I said, why I identify with Ali, because he was the he was the fusion of the body and the mind. So to yeah. me, he he made he he created that ultimate icon that that's always inspired me. And I try to put that in all of my work. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, we're gonna pivot to a couple of questions for Erica and then for Linda. Um, but we want all of you who are in this webinar to join in the conversation. Also, please go into the Q&A. We have moderators from Chelsea Peers who are going to take a look at your questions and make sure that we see them. So if you have any questions after what Dao just shared or what we have going forward, please uh, put them in the chat so that we can uh, have your voice in this conversation as well. Um, Erica, I'm so excited to bring you in. You're the young, the young Zoomer, Gen Z on the panel, um, and also a, an accomplished uh, journalist. Um, uh, so, so early on in your career as a freelancer who has covered sports for AOL, including NFL and Olympic feature profiles, as well as other sports related events. Erica Hardison attended Long Island University where she majored in journalism and minored in sports management and art. A New Jersey resident who's originally from Chicago, Hardison covers culture, diversity and entertainment and parenting topics for Publishers Weekly, USA Today, Huffington Post, the Crisis Magazine, Book Riot, and The Flickering Myth. So welcome, Erica. Thank you for joining us. Because you're the young Gen Z person on our panel and an emerging journalist with a great um, you know, CV already um, developing, um, I, I wanna ask you, what do you see as the most pressing or concerning issue regarding Black athletes and images of the Black body today? Um, well, like you said, I grew up in Chicago. Um, so, you know, my first athletes that I looked up to was Bo Jackson and Michael Jordan and uh, Serena and her sister Venus when they were young. So I've always seen Black athletes, um, especially successful Black athletes. And um, when I minored in sports management, I was like one of only two black girls taking the program. Mm -hmm. um, there are not a lot of black students in the sports management um, uh, sector. Going out to report on athletes, you know, there are a lot of black NFL players, there are a lot of black basketball players, but only a handful of black reporters. And I think that is very problematic because a lot of these um, white reporters, they're coming from, you know, you know, middle America where they haven't really uh, engaged with black people or other minorities and they're getting these sports beats in their local paper and they are interacting with black people as if they're just property. Mm -hmm. as to actual people doing a professional job and a lot of and a lot of that comes from you know not understanding black culture or just anything outside of themselves it also becomes problematic because when rap when um athletes and you know say things or they take certain stances the first thing they want to do you know this is just you know other white reporters uh, uh, their agents, <laughs> their managers, uh, you know, their um, general managers in the league, they get defensive. And when they get defensive, you see all of their racial biases play out and how they talk about them, how they handle them. They can't course correct situations. So the first thing there needs to be is there needs to be more Black sports writers, more black sports editors, more black sports entertainment outlets, um, because we need to tell our stories. And a lot of things become mis 
um, in translation when they're interviewing athletes because they don't understand what they're talking about and they can't report it objectively. Mm -hmm. So I love how you framed this frame of, you know, the stories about African-American athletes in a way that Dawu was talking about framing images of Black people uh, more broadly and Black athletes specifically. Um, I, I want to also ask you about gender identity and gender expression. Mm -hmm. And how does how do both gender identity and gender expression really inform, Erica, your understanding of the Black athlete and the white gaze? Um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, well, there's a few things. Um, I think with the white gaze, when it comes to Black men, Black men athletes, they are hypersexualized already. So, and that plays out into like their everyday reaction. This goes back to them not really interacting with Black people on a day-to-day -day basis. So when they see Black teens on the street, they envision like these big, muscular, powerful athletes, despite that they're children, right? Because they think people are, have like this you know, extra human strength and that we see that with police officers, they get, they get scared, right? They get mm -hmm. scared and they panic and then tragic endings happen. So that's one thing when it comes to um, women athletes, um, there's a lot of transphobia that plays out, especially with women athletes who are dark skin. Mm -hmm. um, they get compared to men they get, you know, just by, you know, um, you know, with the white gaze, the far off they are from the light skin scale or with the, you know, so-called pretty hair, the more they're um, likely to be called ugly. Um, like with Serena, I remember when I was a teen and she was a teen and she had beads in her hair, she got called ugly a lot of times, like half of her career. And it wasn't until you know, other rappers started to co-sign her beauty by objectifying her, that that conversation started to pivot differently. You know, right before then, she was always called too muscular. She must be a man. And we see this with other athletes, them questioning their sexual identity based on what they look like. So there's a lot of issues um, within the white gaze of Black athletes. We're either too strong mm -hmm or not strong enough, or our identity is, in, is questioned because of their limitation of what, you know, gender expression looks like. Yeah, I, you are 100% right. Thank you for sharing your insight and um, amen to everything that you have said as well. It's a great pivot to Linda Villarosa, who has written extensively about Black maternal health and, you know, I'd like Linda to talk a little bit about this sort of objectification, uh, dehumanization in the way that as Black women, Black female athletes are divested of their femaleness so often. And the way that that had real life and death consequences for Serena when she gave birth to her daughter. But first I want to introduce Linda to you. Uh, Linda Villarosa is an award-winning journalist, educator, author, and contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine. Her 2018 cover story, Why America's Black Mothers and Babies Are in a Life or Death Crisis, was nominated for a National Magazine Award, and her 2017, 2017 article, America's Hidden HIV Epidemic, won a National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Award for Excellence in Journalism. Villarosa also contributed an essay on medical myths to the New York Times 1619 project. The author or co-author of three books, Linda is now writing her fourth, Under the Skin, Race, Inequality, and the Health of a Nation for Doubleday. She teaches journalism and Black studies at City College of New York. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. I'm really um, glad to be here and honored to be on this panel with so many smart people. And thank you so much for giving your, your time because I know you're busy with the book. <laughs> so I really appreciate you being here. We're all working so hard these days. Um, but I, I'm glad you're here because I want you to talk about Serena Williams and 
The way that she came forward after the birth of her daughter to talk publicly about her life-threatening experience in the hospital. Again, you are an, an expert on Black maternal health. So can you talk a little bit about what happened to her and the ways that the trope of the strong Black woman figured into her experience in the hospital? Um, well, it was really important that she came forward because she added to this already very robust discussion and kind of shock and horror about what was hap what's happening with um, Black mothers and babies in the United States where we're the only country where um, the number of women who die or almost die in childbirth is rising and black women across class lines are three to four times more likely to die or almost die. So in 2017, Serena Williams was having a normal pregnancy. Um, she went in September to give birth to um, her first child and um, the baby's heart rate dropped a bit. And so she ended up having a C-section. Um, she was fine. She, after the C-section, she was good. But in about 24 hours, she started becoming short of breath, which she recognized as a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in the lungs. And she knew it because she had had it before. Mm -hmm. So she alerted her, the doctors and, you know, and nurses probably, you know, probably at that point, there were more like residents and interns, nurses, about what was going on and even said, I know what this is. I've had it before. I've had medical procedure for this before. And they ignored her legitimate concerns, did not give her the treatment she suggested until she was quite breathless and um, in a crisis. So eventually she got released from the hospital, um, but as a result of the embolism, she was coughing, um, couldn't really catch her breath and burst her um, the stitches in her C-section. So she ended up having like a blood clot in her abdomen. And now what should have been the best day of her life turns into a nightmare. Um, she ended up being um, bedridden for like six months, like a really long time afterwards. And that is wrong because, I mean, it's obviously wrong because she knew what was going on with her. She knows her body better than any human being because, you know, she is, um, you know, the world's greatest athlete, arguably. And um, what was really weird and but sort of was in line with what we knew was, you know, her stature did not protect her against what was clearly racism. Her money did not protect her. Um, when she was um, telling the doctors and, you know, medical personnel what was going on, her competence did not protect her. It probably made them more angry. So mm. the idea that a competent Black woman, you know, should know her body becomes intimidating, becomes maybe angering. Um, and, you know, maybe they didn't like her telling them what to do. And so that is um, alarming that when you even do you're doing what's right you're knowing your body you're you're trying to you know be proactive in your health care but you're punished for it yeah and um you know and trying to be her own advocate right her her own health advocate um you know this coverage and erica uh alluded to this you know talking about serena and venus and the way that they have been you know, through time really divested of their femininity. And I, I think about a recent study that showed that even today there are healthcare professionals who believe that black people have thicker skin than white people, right? Um, and that we can tolerate pain better than uh, white people can. Uh, and in what ways has all of this mythology regarding black female strength fed into a racist narrative that makes not only Serena Williams, but other Black women more vulnerable in terms of, of healthcare. I'm thinking the way that our bodies present as strong and powerful, you know, and yet not fully human and, and vulnerable and in need of professional care. Well, um, the, the myth that goes back all the way to slavery is the idea that we're impervious to pain. And so that was a myth created by Southern, you know, slave in slaveholders to justify enslavement. But the terrible part was that it was um, supported by medical professionals and scientists. So when you were talking about this idea that black people have some kind of superpower against pain, that was in medical journals. It was presented in medical conferences um, you know, during the slavery years. And the study you talked about was 
just a few years ago. And it was of um, doctors to be. So it was medical students and residents who um, the majority of them believed at least one myth about um, blacks being impervious to pain, having thicker skin, having different nerve endings, which is all false, but it's alarming that doctor, medical students are believing these myths. Um, the way it becomes extra harmful is, unfortunately, there's a perfect example of um, what happened in December with a physician named Dr. Susan Moore. So she went into the hospital because she had COVID. So she um, asked for pain medication, which she did not receive because they thought she was drug seeking. So that's a myth that we are more likely to be using drugs or be seeking drugs or jonesing for drugs when um, asking for pain. And also the idea that we're impervious to pain. So she didn't get the pain medication. She didn't, she suggested her own treatment. She was a doctor. And later the hospital said that the reason um, she didn't get the kind of treatment she should have was because the medical providers felt intimidated by her medical knowledge. So she was punished for being a doctor. So she was released from the hospital and she died um, not long after. And as a result, it must have, you know, uh, is the assumption that her bad treatment um, led to her death. So her being, so the pain, you know, myth of pain um, intolerance in black people and the idea is when you're in, when you're competent and you know yourself, you know your body and you have, medic, you have a medical education does not help you. It makes you seem angry or intimidating. And that is another myth that is, causes us harm. Yeah, thank you for your expertise on that, Linda. I appreciate it. Um, it's actually because you were talking about this doctor who died from COVID. Uh, I, I wanna pivot to a question that I see in the Q&A from Molly Kennefeck. Um, who asks us to address how various professional athletes' health has been addressed during the pandemic by different pro franchises. And uh, her more sort of broader question, her broader question is, who's taking care of their athletes the best and who not so much? When we're looking at what's happening to athletes during um, this COVID era, does anybody know the answer to that question? Well, I can give some insight. So um, I'm actually in talks with a um, uh, former athlete who played in the NFL to help him write his book. And um, we was talking about, you know, we know that NFL players, they get hurt a lot, and injured a lot. And one of the biggest takeaways from him and other athletes is that they don't really care unless you are like a very superstar money maker. You don't get the care that you need. You don't get the help that you need. Um, they pay you 16 times a year and you're on your own. And that is basically, um, you know, just the, the hard truth to it. You know, someone like LeBron James, I mean, he has the resources, I think, LeBron James is at a point in his career where he knows if something is wrong with him, he has to depend on himself and his camp. I don't, he's not looking for, towards the league to help him, but you know, every, every player is not LeBron, you know, they have a lot of bench warmers, you know, you know, you have a lot of practice squad players who are, you know, rich in a way, but they still don't have all the resources that, you know, other athletes have and they aren't getting help. They are walking around untreated. Um, we saw it with the other football player who played on the Patriots who who was shooting all those people, I forgot his name, um, Hernandez, right? He killed himself in jail. And when they did all the scans on him, they, they found all like the CTE impact on him and everything like that. So. Um, they're not getting the help that they need, unfortunately. And, you know, once they no, can no longer, you know, make money for people who want to have the money, they're expendable, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I would you. add that um, you also see that at the college level because, mm -hmm. you know, missing a college, you know, a season of college can bankrupt a college. It can bankrupt a, a, a small town. Um, and so you saw some, you know, colleges taking risks with their players, you know, sort of, it's just like this obvious intersection of capitalism and racism, where you were looking at this and saying, wait, should these, um, should these athletes really be playing? What would happen if they missed the season? You know, like, why not have them miss it? 
but then you think, oh, they're losing so much money. And so you see them like Erica, kind of like you were saying, but sort of the level down is, um, you know, putting them at risk really for money. Also, what you just said, what, what would happen if like all of these professional black athletes in college, you know, divest from these big 10 schools and only go to HBCU schools? Mm. The impact of that, I mean, you know, Jerry White Rice went to HBCU and a few others, but if they completely divested as a collective, you know, what, what Oklahoma and Kansas and Louisiana look like without you know, the money making of college black black athletes, because statistically every college athlete is not going to make it. So after college, you know, a school or institution has made millions of dollars on an athlete and that athlete is now not signed to a professional team, um, $100,000 in debt, maybe depending on what this scholarship look like, and they are injured already. Mm. Thank you for sharing that because we have to remember we're, we've been focused so much in this discussion on those famous athletes whose names we all know. Um, and, and Linda and Erica, thank you for bringing it back to the, the, the thousands of athletes whose names we don't know. And I think it's so important when you talk about the commodification, the monetization of black bodies in pro sports, in college sports, um, that this is part of a 400 year history of the monetization of black bodies and uh, the enslavement of black bodies. It makes me think of William Roden's book, $40 million Slaves, right? Um, and so I actually wanna talk about that since we've talked about LeBron quite a bit. Um, I wanna talk a bit about the um, time when Laura Ingram, uh, Fox told him, Fox News, told him to shut up and dribble not too long ago. Um, when he was speaking out uh, about Trump. And, you know, what, what effect does this have? As we've talked a lot about women athletes and Serena in particular, um, how does her Ingram's uh, racist comment really contribute to the overall dehumanization of black bodies and, and really edify this idea that unfortunately, at least 30% of the US population seems to still retain as a kind of truth, even though it's, it's false. This idea that athletes are just a new kind of highly paid servant um, and they are reduced to just their bodies um, and, and are not expected to use their minds and to think. And we can think about Colin Kaepernick in this as well. So does anybody have any insight as to, you know, the effect of that kind of language and sort of this, this feeling in the popular imagination that, that, you know, athletes are really just their bodies. They're, they're no more than that. Um, well, to be frank, you know, when we think about racism and white supremacy, I think we always think of it from a um, patriarchal, patriarchal standpoint where we think about this white men because they're at the top of the oppression scale. But, you know, white women also play into that um, oppression as well. And for a white woman with a platform on the platform that she has on Fox News to say something that about that about a black man is very offensive <laughs> because she's saying it from a place um, um, as someone who feels that, you know, sh he should just shut up and just take his money and do what he's told. He's not a person. And when we talk, when we revisit, you know, tales from previous years and our ancestors on, you know, how slaves live, I think a lot of the conversation gets left out on the white women's um, involvement, you know, sometimes they were even worse than their male counterparts when it came to slavery. They was more abusive, especially to women and men. They, you know, raped too. So, um, you know, her words were not innocent and just, you know, something by fly by the night. It was very intentional. And, um, you know, they're just as complicit. And, you know, um, that type of language is how people get seriously hurt. And, and I, she knows her impact and her viewers know her impact. And you can see her impact on Twitter when people are flooding his mentions, calling him, you know, all types of slurs based on what she said. 
Yeah, I think you're right. And that point that Daoud was making earlier and connecting, you know, what happens on the court, what happens on Fox News, and what happens to, uh, you know, a LeBron James, but any other Black man who's being stopped by the police and being pulled over uh, by the police, right? There are life and death consequences for us for this kind of language. And, you know, talking about people who literally have a microphone, who have a platform, we can't let Don Imus off the hook. And in 2007, again, as I said in the introduction, he really denigrated the 2007 Rutgers University basketball team uh, with the vile language that he used. Um, and Linda, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the impact that he had on the perception of black women um, uh, around that time. And you know, what did he kind of expose with that comment, that public comment? And then I'd, I'd like you, Dawood, to jump in here also and let us know, do public expressions of racist terminology like the, the nappy-headed hose comment used by uh, Don Imus, does that impact your work as an artist? And if so, how? You know, is there a kind of activism in your art where you're trying to push back against that kind of language? Um, but Linda, if, if you could go first and talk about Don Imus's comment and the impact that that had on black women, not just on the team, but more broadly. Well, the first, I mean, it's it's the intersection of terribleness because it starts with the hair. So you're, call, so you're making fun or whatever, a black hair. Um, and then you're uh, talking about sexuality. And um, what was, uh, I mean, I remember that. And I remember, and it was like, what is going on here? What, what does he even know about women's basketball? Why is he speaking about it? Why are you opening your mouth to talk about that? But also, I, I think he just thought it would blow over. You know, it'd be like, oh yeah, that's so funny, but it wasn't. And there was wide protest for him. He, you know, ultimately lost his job, you know, it, and that was kind of like the beginning of the end for him. Of course, he ended up on Fox News. But, um, but, the, but the terrible part and the ironic part of that was that team that year was really good. Yeah. but also dignified. Their coach was Vivian Stringer, who is one of the most respected, you know, full of grace people, you know, to be involved in sports as a coach. So she set a high standard of their behavior. So, uh, on, you know, off the court, she was demanding around that. So to be called that was wrong and weird and was only racist. There was nothing behind it. But, you know, sort of circling back, um, Don Imus died a, about a little over a year ago. And when he died, Vivian Stringer, God bless her, sent a note of condolence. I mean, that was the most insulting to her personally and to these young women, but she sent a note of condolence to his family, just showing that she rose above this mess and um, forgave. Mm -hmm. that's, that's real grace. That's real grace. Um, now we'll talk a little bit more about how this kind of you know, whether it's Laura Ingram on Fox or Don Imus, I think he was on CBS radio at the time. Um, but when you hear this kind of language, how does it inform the work that you produce? And, and does it inspire, well, your, it sounds like your parents inspired, but fuel that kind of activism that you bring to your work as an illustrator? Um, yeah, I, I think it, it goes, uh, I, don't know, I, I, put it, I put it like this. Um, I'm aware of so many things that, that may go on around us, you know, for years in terms of like racist statements or people that's try to belittle you with their words. And, and I think once you're really aware of what's going on, I really don't, it, the shock value of what it is doesn't really impact me because I'm not really reactionary to these types of things when they happen, it's like, to me, it's almost like, you know, if, if, uh, if a pig goes oink, I'm not gonna respond in a, like I'm surprised because there's a history of them doing that. You know what I'm saying? So um, in a scenario like this, you know, when things like that, I, I hear it. Um, I might not necessarily be the one that's uh, involved in it, but it doesn't pull me off my base. You know, like, oh man, I gotta stop everything I'm doing and draw a picture that responds to Don I'm is saying, you know, his phrase, because I feel that what I'm doing is, is always going to be counter to that anyway, by doing something that represents our power or our, our 
us being majestic or supreme because that still has, the, the way that to counter this is by creating something greater that outshines that because that's ignorance. It's just like if somebody says you're, um, you know, you're a, water, you're a watermelon eater. I say, well, you know what? Watermelon is a superfood. I'm glad I eat watermelon. So then what it is, you just turned it around and then it's like, now if you said I ate something that, that, that is depleting the nutrients from my body sucks, you know, sucks the, you know, the, the, um, the life out of my body, then maybe that, you know, that, that's something I could be uh, more ashamed of, but I'm not ashamed to eat a watermelon if that's what you're thinking. You know, sometimes you got just got to turn it around on them what they're saying and let them know it doesn't affect you because when you when you look at bully talk, the the, the purpose of bully talk is to get you to react and respond because then they got you. Now I'm going to do this and get you to react this way. So now they got the remote on you getting you to, to respond a certain way, but if you don't respond that way and you keep building and growing and growing and you tap into that god power within it's like they don't know what to do with you next because they they reached their bag and they said all the words that they could say but you you're uh excelling beyond that you know that's that's my perspective i don't say nothing should action shouldn't take place i'm saying you know i'm not in that space of you know i can pull them off the radio or, or whatever but but there's going to be there's so many people like him that walk this planet and like like her that would make statements like this but i feel as though we also need to be focused on our greater self. And that, to me, that's one of the, the, the best ways to counter, counter a lot of ignorance. You know, you're reminding me, Dawood, I mentioned Toni Morrison earlier of that um, interview that we've all seen many times now um, in celebrating her life and her work where she was talking to Charlie Rose. And I think that was the interview, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but where she was saying, it's like there's this little white man that sits on your shoulder and looks over at the work that you're doing when you produce it. And that James Baldwin had taught her that you just have to flick that little <laughs> man right off your shoulder and get the work done. It sounds like he has been flicked by you, Daoud. And, and your counter narrative is just to, you know, show us in all of our beautiful blackness. And, and, but that, that was my point about drawing from the soul. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't create outside in. Like if I start, stop doing everything I'm doing and start making Don Imus drawings and say, hey, everybody, you know, I'm actually blowing him up. I'm making him big. I'm using my talent to hold him up when it's just like, okay, he said the same ignorant stuff that I've been hearing for years, but the stuff that I think needs to be created should not be railroaded. I should put this time into creating the things that we need to see. And, and, and another flip, on the term nappy head, you know, hose, that's a whole another thing, but the nappy head, you're talking about the helix. And, and, and we have to embrace the fact that our hair grows out like an antenna and it pulls information in from the universe. That's something to be proud of. You see what I'm saying? Like we have to sometimes remember the things that they're saying is out of ignorance where you don't realize that when you're using the words, you don't really understand what nappy head, what a nappy head actually means. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and when we embrace it, we embrace bra yeah. braids, twists, locks. Uh, you know, when we were younger, we said naps and stuff like that, but we may say it in a loving way, you know, but in essence, what I look at it is from the perspective, of, hey, the locks, dreadlocks, all that stuff, we're pulling in signals, we're pulling in things from other dimensions. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're just jealous because you don't have that. Yours, right. you're, you bounce things back out into the universe, we pull it in and re retain it mm -hmm. and that leads to that athleticism you know that um to to take something in and turn it into something you know flip it upside down you know that's what hip-hop jazz and all that stuff is it's us pulling and channeling from another dimension and showing people things that just never existed before and it blows people's minds so what we have to do is to stand stand in our greatness and let the ignorance okay they say some ignorant you know, let the people, because that's also a part of a, a holistic lifestyle and being in the circle. There's going to be people that handle that. Let them handle that. Okay, while that's being handled, I'm creating something for our children to be proud of. And somebody else may be working on something over here. Um, and so that's how, that, that's how I'm looking at it. Yeah, 
I, I think Erica wants to jump into this conversation. I just want to say, please add your questions in the Q&A um, because we want to respond to them. Um, Erica, yes, please, sister. Um, I think that's the, the slight disconnect from millennials and Zoomers. You know, we don't want to always extend grace because grace is an option. You know, um, we, it, it should not be expected. And I think because for so long has it has always been expected that if someone, you know, calls you names and they are racist towards you and they try to beat you or even almost kill you, that you know you're going to be the better person because whether it's your faith or where you think that's just the right thing to do morally, which is fine, that you're going to be giving grace. We don't, you know, grace is again, grace is not something that is you know, automatic is, is, is to, you know, or varies person to person. And Zoomer and, and millennials, we want to stop the behavior because it's a circle of abuse. It's a circle of abuse because, you know, we're seeing this trend of, you know, white kids in their coming of age years going through this uh, cycle where they're all racist and they're, they're experiencing Expected to be forgiven because they were just kids and they get to move on with their life and do whatever they want. We want to call it out. We want to stop it. We want to embarrass you. Um, if we have to take your social capital, we want to do that. If you have to get fired, we want to do that. We want to be, we want someone to hold, be held accountable for their actions because for so long they haven't been held accountable. You, you know, you cannot expect oppressed people or oppressed groups to teach the oppressors. That's not what freedom looks like and it will never look like that. If that was the case, you know, we would be free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's a level of accountability that we are looking for and we're, we're going to keep our feet on their necks until they either change course or, you know, we're just gonna have to um, be more radical in our stands. And as far as you know, my art and my writing, I have completely, you know, decolonized. You know, my reading, my literature, what I'm looking for. Um, you know, oftentimes even to my assignments, I don't take everything if I don't morally feel like it aligns with what I believe in. So I try my best to do work that will reflect the best out of me and my community. That's beautiful. And, you know, thank you for not just holding, you know, white supremacy and the voice of white supremacy, the voices of white supremacy accountable, but also, you know, speaking to us as, you know, older culture workers, right? Um, because what you just said is important for us to hold and to keep in our hearts. I actually want to use this. I see a couple things in the chat, but I want to pivot really quickly to, and I, I know we've mentioned them a lot, but it, because we were talking about hair, um, Venus and Serena, when they were children, really, um, and starting their tennis careers, and they wore their hair in braids and beads, a way that a lot of us did growing up. Um, how do we, to your point, Erica, you know, like one way to look at that is, well, that horse left the barn. They got denigrated. It happened a long time ago. What are we supposed to do about it now? So let me ask you, you know, do we go back in time? Do we excavate that past? Do we do we um, look at the people who made those statements? You know, how do we respond to the ways that Black athletes have been denigrated historically now that we're in this inflection moment and we're holding people accountable, as you said? Um, well, we kind of seen this conversation during the elections, right? There, there was this, this group of, of you know, radical leftists or whatever you want to call them, you know, urging um, President Biden to be accountable for his actions with the crime bill, with Anita Hill, wants to be held accountable. And, you know, I think he did what the best he thought he could do by apologizing, apologizing and reaching out to Anita Hill. But the point of that was that would, ha would he have done that if there was not the pushback of, you know, holding him accountable? You know, 
um, do do myself and other millennials and Zoomers want to you know use our social media to to scream at people to hold them accountable? No, we want people to be accountable on their own. It's okay to take a step back and say, you know what, this was wrong. I've grown from this, and I'm going to take what I've grown and teach other people so they won't make the mistake that I do. But we don't see that, especially when it comes to the white gays. We see them either double double down on it, continue to do it, or you know, do the whole reverse racism conversation. So we're not seeing the accountability. Once we see the accountability, you know, our tone and our strategy would change, but we're not seeing it right now. So um, as far as previous athletes, that's a really good question because I guess it depends on the athlete because there are some athletes who are very comfortable within the white gaze um, and they prefer it. <laughs> so it really depends on the athlete because, you know, I don't mind sticking up the Serena, but, you know, I wouldn't do the same for like OJ Simpson. So it really depends on the athlete. Right. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, I do want to go to the Q&A now and um, the, talking about accountability, an anonymous attendee wanted to ask a question about black men. Do you feel as though black men have taken the role of their white predecessors by sexualizing and masculinizing dark-skinned women? What is the solution for this separation? Now, uh, in parentheses, it says answered by Dawood, but would like other responses. What is the solution for issues where black people are dehumanized by society? Linda, can you speak to that? Well. Um... I, I, before I was on this call, I was teaching my race and media class and we talked about critical race theory. So critical race theory um, talks about the idea that all of us are poisoned by, um, you know, age old stereotypes of um, black people. And so I don't really love separating who's, who's, who's doing what. All of us are poisoned by it and all of us have to think about it and all of us have to work through it. And so um, these, we've all been um, harmed by these and we all have to dislodge them from our brains. And um, so I would say, you know, dislodging it from your brain, <laughs> working on it. Um, my students and I, we roll up our sleeves every, you know, Tuesday um, for three hours and talk about race and media and how we're all, you know, we see these images, we don't think twice about them and how to learn to think twice and question them and interrogate them. And all of us have to do that work. Yeah, yeah. So we all have to interrogate the images. We all have to interrogate the narrative to Dawood's point, create a counter narrative, images that defy that racist narrative. Um, and to Erica's point, begin to hold people responsible um, for uh, propagating the mythologies that really jeopardize not just the lives of athletes, but of all black people globally. Um, there was another question from an anonymous attendee who asks, are there any sports or health related nonprofits or organizations you recommend that are helping to make these much needed changes. So this person is really looking for uh, solutions like the, the first person did. So Linda's point was we all have to begin to interrogate. We all have to, you know, using critical race theory as a starting point, right? Do this important work and decolonizing our own minds um, going forward. But are there any organizations that are helping to make these changes that any of you know of? Um, well, I would like to, uh, shout out this organization that I really love um, called the um, Institute for Healing and Justice in Medicine. So it's it's very medical focused, and it's um, medical students in it started in Ber at in, at Berkeley with medical students who are also getting um, a, a master's degree in public health. And what they did was they created this really smart with no money at all, and they did it themselves while attending medical school. Um, uh, asking other physicians and other medical schools to um, push back against racial stereotypes that have been 
that have infested medicine. And the one that matters here is um, has to do with kidney function. So kidney function, one way to measure it is through um, creatine and creatine is secreted by the muscles. So when measuring kidney, one of the measurements of kidney function has a race correction. So the race correction, um, if you're black, you get a different reading. Um, and if you're white, you get a different reading. There's a calculation that's multiplied. And so this, some of the medical students have like, why do the black people get a different reading? I don't understand. But when, you, when they asked their professors why they got the reading, it was because they were told this without any interrogation, black people have more muscle mass. And so oh, wow. because of muscle mass, there's a race correction in the way kidney function is um, measured. And it really matters because black people are more likely to have kidney problems and to have you know, especially in stage renal disease. So if this race correction is affecting the way that, you know, the kidney function is measured, that's really dangerous. Um, and I love one of the question, one of the sort of pushbacks was by Dorothy Roberts, who is, you know, one of the geniuses of, um, in this area of medical medicine and race. And what she said is, why is there an assumption that someone like me, a really tiny black woman <laughs> has more muscle mass than a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. And so obviously this is race into a, a algorithm and a calculation that should be race blind because it's science. Mm -hmm. So I love that the medical students Institute for Healing and Justice in Medicine are pushing back and, and other organizations too, but this is the one that I'm very impressed with because they're doing it as while going to medical school and with no money. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that information and that organization. Um, so one other thing, just really quickly in the Q&A, um, Mick Wa said earlier that, um, Dawood, when you were talking about our hair and how it spirals out and how it's antenna, and we're, it, Mick Wa said that would be a great superhero power with the antenna. <laughs> Actually, I, I think there, there is a character named Dreadlocks, uh, uh, by the brother named Andre Batts out of Detroit. And his power comes from his hair. Like Samson. <laughs> yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. And Jesus. Um, you know, Erica, you were talking so much about accountability. I wanna ask you about the Vogue cover that I showed earlier. Um, and, you know, when you look at that cover on its own, what, what sort of surfaces for you? And then when you see it juxtaposed with the World War I Army recruitment poster, you know, what sort of surfaces for you when you look at that cover? Because there's a lot happening there. I mean, to be fair and to be completely honest, when I saw it, I mean, I was like, okay, this is racist. I mean, this is not the first time Vogue has, you know, crossed the line of racism. Um, it's not the first time they've, you know, not done well with their black covers. You know, I think the only people who get really good covers out of Vogue is like uh, Michelle Obama and Beyonce, and that's because they hired their own team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they don't, you know, just go in and let Vogue do whatever Vogue wants to do. Um, it's it's also kind of creepy uh, because it kind of reminds me of like again the stereotype that white women some white women have with black men's bodies and you know being very hypersexual and um uh the you know fetishizing them and everything like that so it's it's a little creepy that you know um when we talk about femininity you know women have never defined femininity we claim it right we define femininity based on you know who we are but the concept of femininity was created by men. Men set the standards for femininity. So when we, that cover looks like, you know, the standard of what is considered feminine in America and through Eurocentric um, ideas. And this is what masculine black people, black men look like. They're big, they're tall, they're strong, they're aggressive, you know, and here she is in this silk, dress you know almost falling off his arms and very dainty ish like you know like she is a um like you know she's almost his mating and in, in some things so, i mean 
I don't particularly care for. Um, I think they gave like a half apology. I'm not really sure. I don't really remember, but I'm sure there'll be another one soon that they will be apologizing for. Yeah. Well, the Kamala Harris uh, covered was not very well received by some people as well. Um, so it's it's not just athletes for sure. I wanted uh, Linda? to uh, add to that is to say that um, Vogue magazine is part of the media <laughs> industrial complex where 70, 80% of um, the people who are the deciders, who are the photographers, who are the editors, who are the writers, who are the producers are white. And so to think about that Vogue cover, Erica, you said, I, you know, I looked at that and I thought it was racist. Well, think of how many other people looked at that cover before it was, you know, it, be it became a cover. So we've seen the devil wears Prada. And so, you know, all those women are, and some men are in the room saying, oh yeah, I love that. I love it. And so a bunch of people signed off on that. And, you know, obviously most of them are white. Um, the reckoning that has come with Vogue specifically is, you know, Anna Wintour has been accused by her black, you know, the few black staffers that they are, it is creating a culture of um, cruelty and meanness behind the scenes so that their people don't even want to work there. And um, I, I think it's leading to some different kind of hiring practices. But if that is what is happening behind the scenes, people look at the cover and don't see that reference, don't see the sort of, you know, the black man, white woman, um, bad juxtaposition, um, because all of them have a blind spot, because they're, it, you know, it's such an undiverse group. And I think that's important to think about who's deciding on these images. Um. I'm going into the Q&A again. Um, oh, okay, sorry. That was something that was um, that came up before. So I, I want to talk about this connection between the fetishization of Black bodies and Black athletes and the criminalization of Black people, right? And I just want to be really explicit in drawing a line between the two, right? Because there is an element, you know, Linda, when you were talking about there being, you know, white women in that room, you know, there has likely a kind of titillation, right, when they look at an image like that. And um, because they are um, animated or aroused by it, um, even subconsciously so, that that's part of what makes it um, uh, sort of approved to be printed and made into the cover, right? So on the, you know, and it's this Afro-futuristic, Afro-surreal experience of being Black in America. And simultaneously, we're centered. We're at the center. We have the spotlight on us. You know, we're in the room and, it, and all eyes turn to gaze upon us. And yet simultaneously, we're marginalized. We don't have full voiced expression. We don't have the team of people who are there to support and scaffold us, as Erica said. Um, and so we're kind of voiceless at the same time. And it's a strange tension, but it's our everyday experience in this country. And similarly, you know, we, we're the fetish, right? We're the ones that are consumed by whiteness, by white America, and yet we're marginalized and unable to be our full selves. So can, can, can you draw that line between the way that we've been fetishized and the way that we've been criminalized and how that plays out in American sport? Right, so that even somebody like Colin Kaepernick is a criminal to certain people in this country because of the posture that he takes with his black body, because of what he chooses to do with his black body. Well, I think that uh, you said it really well, um, and I agree. And, um, but, you know, I'm thinking about the idea that we're invulnerable to pain so that we know there's a through line from enslavement, but also the idea that we have superhuman strength so that we can, I mean, also uh, during enslavement, that was, that was a myth, a physiological myth that helped um, support this industry that was, you know, free labor that was making the country rich. And so that through line exists today. And so when you look at someone like George Floyd, or you look at any of the men and Breonna Taylor, it was this idea that, oh, they're impervious to pain and they have, uh, and also superhuman strength that um, it's like, oh, we have to put the, our knee on this man's neck to, because he's so strong. And 
I mean, that is a through line with many of these um, police shootings and all this violence against, you know, police, uh, state sanctioned violence with the police is about the, I, the myth that we have a superhuman strength, um, not just criminality, but a strength that must, we have to take extra measures to subdue. So that is what's scary. And that is why these, you know, we really have to pay attention to these myths that um, are so old, they're like ancient, but mm -hmm. they still exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's ushered in at an early age too. That's why a lot of our youth are looked upon as men, you know, grown men and they're minors. <laughs> um, you know, they're intimidating. Like uh, my nephew, he, uh, well, when he was younger, he's artistic, but uh, you know he he's big like Shaquille O'Neal, but he he's um, you know his his functions you know he uh, his mental functions you know is not a hundred percent because he's he's autistic, but those those are things that you know just observing with our our youth are always concerned about how people look at them and all automatically assume that, you know, they're up to no good. And then we live in a culture where now, you know, uh, within the music, a lot of the music that supports that, that imagery, you know, like the bravado and, and things of that nature. Um, and all that is by design, you know, it's, it's not necessarily on the artist, it's who they decide to promote and put out there. Just like when we talk about the, the Vogue cover, that's not something by chance that that goes back to what I was saying before about everything is conceptually designed. You know, if I work on a project, I work on film projects and things of that nature as well. I can't just stick anything in there because the directors know, oh, that's not supposed to be in there. It's supposed to go this way because they know what the, they know the impact they want to make on the audience when it comes back, when it comes out. And that goes all the way back to the original birth of a nation, which that film basically set the standard for utilizing Hollywood as a, the magic wand, which the Hollywood is. It's the wood, wood of the Hollywood tree to, to, to um, cast spells and to have people follow their vision of what they want to happen. So they're doing the same. So Vogue Magazine, all these mag, they understand what they're doing. I don't believe it's mm -hmm. out of ignorance. It's, it's, they, can, they can play it's like, oh, we didn't know. You know, we didn't know that's what it was, but uh, to your point earlier, if any of us were in the room during the photo shoot, we'd be like, yo, what's this? What's going on? <laughs> but we're not in the room doing the decision making. So the ones that are in the room, to them, that's great. And we're saying, well, why couldn't he just, you know, if anything, maybe there's a, a supermodel that's a sister and, and maybe they're just, you know, standing with each other. He doesn't have to be so brutish. Because mm -hmm. we know we know he's a beast on the court. He doesn't have to be a beast 24-7. Right. You know, if he's just relaxed, you know, just in a relaxed pose, we get it. We get that he's strong. Mm -hmm. But see, that's us humanizing him. They right. they want to dehumanize. And that starts with the children, with the males, they do that, and with with our young women, they do that at an early age. And that's why they want to say, you know, black women are hard to deal with. Their All that is a trope. The young black man, he's hard to deal with, blah, blah, blah. That's a trope. And then they pit us to get against each other as well, which all of that is designed to just keep us separate, to, to um, uh, create this image, you know, that we're just basically hard to deal with. And that's why I say, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's something that I feel like as an artist, it's, it's crucial for the arts and media to counter that because so many people consume media and we're in a media culture now. You know what I mean? So I just thought I'd throw that in. No, Dawood, I'm glad that you did. And I, I'm conscious of time, we have nine minutes left, but Erica was talking earlier about 
you know, turning down certain assignments as a professional, you know, and, and making a real conscious decision about what she decided to cover. So I, I see all your mics are on. I, I want you to sort of say what you want to say in response to what Daoud was just saying. But if you can also talk as professionals, what is it like for you when you're in the room, right? Who is there? If it's not the little white man that's on your shoulder, judging everything that you produce, who are the literal people that are in the room? And how do you as cultural workers sort of um, negotiate that space, particularly when you're either drawing, illustrating or writing about black people more broadly, but specifically African-American athletes. So Erica, do you wanna, do you wanna go first on that? Sure. So, you know, I've written for ALL, Huffington Post. Um, my pieces have been on CNN, Washington Post. You know, I've pretty much been in all the mainstream media um, with different, you know, articles and takes on culture and entertainment. Um, for a large part of my professional life, I've been the only Black reporter or the only woman reporter. In, in the spaces, even when I stepped out of journalism and went into marketing, the only black girl in the marketing room. And it's not intimidating, but you get erased very quickly. You know, the opinions and, and, the, and the input that you put in, you have to really fight. I have to fight for a lot of my stories. I have to pitch hard. You know, I've had editors tell me no, and then another white writer will pitch something similar and it'll get picked up. And that's just what it is. My only solution is, you know, I got, you know, I, I don't want, I feel like the news and the stories I want to tell, you know, I've accepted that all white platforms are not going to accept it. And it sucks because I want to get paid for what I do. But I, they are, I'm passionate about a lot of things. And I, my only solution is I, I started publishing my own magazine. I started publishing my own pieces independently. You know, I want to talk about Black authors and I want to talk about, you know, interview, you know, Black athletes and entertainers and talk about Afrofuturism. And I do it under of a Black gaze to Black people. So I can talk and use certain jargon. The readers know what I'm talking about, you know. Um, I don't have to explain myself. I don't have to explain my Blackness. I don't have to explain my identity. So that's my only solution until, you know, there's a shift in, you know, uh, these uh, entertainers and athletes put more, you know, money where the mouth is and there are more Black media outlets. That's the only solution that I have for right now. That's beautiful. And, and along with them going to HBCUs, wow, what a powerful idea. Really great. Um, Linda, do you want to respond to that or? Well, um, Erica, just get your magazine together. I'll definitely be one of your contributors. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm well paid so you can afford. <laughs> I'll work for free. Um, and I'm saying that publicly. So um, I think, well, it's interesting. I had two things to say. Once I used to be like a, a young, you know, younger person and I covered sports. And I remember when Flojo was had her transformation and she had, she came out with the one legger. She had the nails, the hair, all her, she had her new look. And I was the always the only, you know, black woman covering sports, often the only black person. And I remember when she came out with her new look and everyone was turning to me and asking, what's going on with her? And so I remember I thought, oh, I think I've done a service because I've, you know, these mostly white guys are like, what's happening? <laughs> Why does she look like that? And I'm like, my God, she's beautiful. Look at how creative she is. She, she figured out the one legger. Look at her legs are perfect. Look, and it was really fun. It was like a moment where I thought, oh, maybe there is a, a, a nice thing about being like in this, you know, the, the black, the fly in the buttermilk, so to speak. Um, but what I do now it, at this point in my career is um, I write almost exclusively for the New York Times Magazine because it's a, a good progressive home for me. There are other, you know, I'm not the only one. Nicole Hannah-Jones, like our in-house genius, um, is at the New York Times Magazine. Wesley Morris and Jenna Wortham are at the New York Times Magazine. And so, you know, Jenna Wortham just came out with the Black Futures book. I contributed something in that. And so I have a really good space where I can be, you know, like editors support me and decide. And that's a choice. I'm often asked to contribute to other places. And I basically 
kind of say no most of the time because I really um, appreciate being appreciated, being heard, listened to, and being able to, you know, write the things I want to write. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. And Erica, for responding in the Q&A. Appreciate that. Uh, Dawood? Yeah. Um, yeah. And briefly for me, um, I had a for I had a fortune to be able to, you know, most of my adult years from 19 years up to now I'm 56. I've been an entrepreneur most of my life, but I also had the opportunity to work in production studios in New York, LA and Atlanta. So I got to get like both sides of it. And I do remember like at a younger age when I first started working on my own comic book, uh, Brother Man, I was in East Orange, New Jersey at the time. And I remember some brothers being in the store while I was working on the comic book. And this is before people were even talking black comic books because I book set that off. And I remember the brother saying to me, hey, you know, uh, you, if, you, if you don't have Marvel and DC behind you, you're wasting your time. Mm. And even at that age, I said, I was 24. I said, now nah, you'd be wasting your time because they're not in my head like that. You know what I mean? So sometimes we, like you said, the little white man that's on your shoulder, and they're also, they're also swimming around in your mind. And you have to sometimes say, I'm not concerned about what Marvel and DC is doing. No, no disrespect to it, but I'm building my own thing. Can I just build my own thing? And it's just my own thing. You know what I mean? And then also uh, years later, working on other projects. I mean, I've had plenty of projects that I had to turn down, walk away from, because I could tell what they were trying to do is utilize my talent to put out things that I felt were self-destructive in terms of imagery, but I'm aware of what the image is. And I, I always felt as though I think from being an entrepreneur for a long time, that I would turn down a project because I can always go back and draw somebody on the street for $25 and have dinner that night. So I can turn down a project because I know my worth. I say, okay, if this, if I turn that down, it opens up the, 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 uh, my space or my schedule to work on something else that I feel, oh, okay, this, this is a good connection to me. So that's, that's the thing that I, you know, that's how I kind of handle it and look at it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, um, I, I wanted to conclude with thinking about Arthur Ashe and Althea Gibson in their tennis whites. And as Linda mentioned again, that beautiful, uh, Flojo, uh, all those beautiful images of her just coming out with her bold colors and her nails and everything and, and Serena doing the same thing. Um, and, and what I wish for all of our athletes, for all of our people is for us to have real freedom, real liberation, to be able to come to this world however we are meant to come to this world and to freely be ourselves, our authentic selves and to be liberated from all of these tropes that hold us down. Um, so I want to thank you, Erica Hardison, for, for bringing the noise, for bringing the ruckus, for bringing the, the sensibility and uh, this youth perspective. Daoud, um, just in awe of the work that you produce and the awards that you've gotten, thank you for taking time from your schedule to really celebrate with us the beautiful Blackness that you capture in the work that you produce and continuing to do that work. And Linda, you're just the consummate professional and yet you've given your time as well. Um, please continue to do this work that focuses on our health and our wellness and our beautiful black bodies because I know that you are saving lives with the work that you do. And thank you to Chelsea Peers for giving us this space. We're all so thankful. And to all of you participants, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Good, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.